Hi, I'm Mike from Hackaday, and we're here at the Supercon, and Kip Bradford has just joined us. Uh, it's so great to meet you. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great. So I've followed your work for a long time, and I really appreci appreciate you being a Hackaday Prize judge this year. I'm working to solve two challenges. One is smarter heating and cooling so that we can have more efficient buildings and also more comfortable people. And the second is trying to figure out new ways to pump heat um, where there are none existing today. And the goal of that work is to reduce global warming. I kind of wanted to start talking about your area of expertise, um, which is uh, things related to, to the health field. And uh, specifically, I'm wondering, um, we're seeing a ton of devices that are being built to service um, health needs and, and uh, uh, assistive technology needs. Um, what are your thoughts on like, the level of expertise that's needed in order to develop those? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities in biomedical engineering uh, in general, but really at the, I'm, I'm an instrumentation person at heart. Um, I studied biomechanics, but spent most of my career in college tinkering on devices mm -hmm. and took my first job out of college at a company that had made medical devices for a long time. Weirdly, when I took that job, they switched from medical devices to inventing toys. But <laughs> after a few years of that, as a toy inventor, I got back into uh, making medical devices. And there's a lot of things that we don't know about the human body. There are a lot of things that we should measure better. There are uh, incredible instruments that uh, cost tremendous amounts of money because a ton went into R&D um, that do diagnostics that provide fantastic insights about the state of somebody's body. Um, but the idea that those diagnostics take place, like if you're lucky once a year, mm -hmm. uh, is completely absurd in an age when I can have a Boeing 747 where, or an uh, Airbus A380 where every point of that, that uh, structure is measured continually, creating terabytes of data that give you the health status of that airplane. Mm. Now, what kind of changes to health outcomes could we have if we could mm -hmm. do that with our bodies? And I think um, there are good regulatory mechanisms in place which make it hard for people to introduce products mm -hmm. into the market that could potentially cause harm. And I think it's important to recognize mm -hmm. those regulations and why they exist and what they're good for. At the same time, I think there's a lot of space for people to start looking at ways to reduce the cost of some of the devices that we use every day or that, that the medical establishment uses that, that um, are pretty expensive. And I don't necessarily uh, need to see a huge purging market of makers doing like, hey, look, I made my own implantable defibrillator. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> no. Um, could you reinvent some components in that and open source it and then uh, some other company, like a startup, could come along and make a much less expensive implantable defibrillator going through the appropriate mm -hmm. safety checks to make sure that it's not something that will injure people. Absolutely, and that's fantastic. Like We should build on each other's innovation. So I think mm -hmm. that there's that layer where some of the, the more highly regulated medical devices could be cost reduced through kind of crowdsourced innovation. Um, and there's potential there and opportunities there, mm -hmm. um, but the regulatory structures in place in those domains are good <laughs> and we shouldn't rail against them. On the other hand, there are also opportunities for things that aren't as heavily regulated, like uh, I think there are going to be changes in the hearing aid market very soon. That'd be great. And that would be really great yeah. uh, to see a lot more innovation, to see mm -hmm. a lot more different ways of thinking about those devices that could be brought into the world from a broader developer community. Yeah, I mean, I know we've seen a lot of innovation with, um, you know, like the profiles of how the hearing aids are working, but it's still, you know, I see someone having the only point of contact yeah. be a little uh, knob that they can turn with their finger, and I wonder, we must be able to do better than we this. We can definitely do better than this, but <laughs> that's one of these industries where there really aren't a lot of outsiders, there's not, mm -hmm. like, there's not a supply chain that you can access very easily unless you really know the three people to call mm -hmm. and uh, and have a large enough business that they'll answer the phone for you. So um, 
being able to break some of those domains open mm -hmm. and rethink the human interface and rethink um, how we can improve those mm -hmm. technologies and make them more, more effective, more efficient, less expensive, more accessible, uh, I think it's fantastic. And there's a, there's a wide variety of other things like uh, one of the Hackaday Prize uh, contest projects that you and I had talked about, um, which was a single lead electrocardiogram. Oh, the Hardy Patch. The yeah, Hardy I remember patch. that one. Um, that was basically taking something that, that's pretty well known. It's been done before. And you can buy it at Amazon for a hundred bucks. Um, 20 years ago, an electrocardiogram that was portable and battery powered that was like wireless would have cost you thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. So there's a lot of community development that's brought the cost down and the more that those components are broken out and open sourced and become the building blocks that people can innovate upon uh, is really valuable. And again, recognizing that there's a difference between me tinkering on something in my mm -hmm. workshop and saying, oh look, I can measure my pulse. <laughs> there's a difference between that and then going and saying, now that I can measure my pulse, I'm gonna introduce a product that I'm gonna sell and I'm gonna put a label on it that says, this will diagnose your condition. Like that's a whole different level of, of uh, potential effect on a user that people just have to be sensitive to and aware of and know that, yeah, it's okay to tinker on something and then put that project out there to share it so mm -hmm. that the knowledge base grows. But it's different to try to make a profit off of that uh, without going through the proper steps to make sure that you've got something safe. Yeah, and I think a big part of that is is maintaining trust that you know people that don't understand the technology can still trust the devices even though they're now right. available to them every day instead of like you said right. once a year. Yep. So uh, when we were uh, just before we sat down here, um, we were talking a little bit about how you know um, building new medical devices is, is really sexy and really interesting, and a lot of people want to get into it. Um, but you you mentioned that there's uh, it's worthwhile to look at some stuff that's not that's not quite as interesting and maybe work on boring projects. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> boring is a funky word. Um, you know, there's so much infrastructure around us mm. like the electrical infrastructure the electrical grid concrete buildings uh hvac that you know that i'm uh trying to disrupt there's plumbing even i mean we see crises like the flint water crisis where the stuff around us <laughs> it's not the appealing thing it's not the thing that's the new emerging tech but it's something that we take for granted mm -hmm. and we shouldn't. People should be looking at some of the, 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 the AKA more boring things mm -hmm. and figuring out, are there better ways to do this? We, we have materials in our plumbing system that are hundred years old and you know, $300 billion are going to be spent over the next few decades mm -hmm. on upgrading plumbing system. Where are, the tinkerers and hackers saying, hey, maybe there's a better way to actually get fresh water into people's houses. Like if we're gonna be tearing up this infrastructure, replacing it with something new, let's really see if we can innovate on it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not necessarily as immediately appealing. There are no blinky LEDs, but at the same time, the impact on people's lives is tremendous. I think there are just a lot of underappreciated technologies that just don't have Arduinos inside. Yeah, well, I mean, revolutionizing the water delivery system will affect far more people than medical devices will, um, yeah. at least on a recurring yep. recurring basis. Um, I thought it was really interesting. I, I watched your talk and I really loved it. It was really interesting to hear you talk about the uh, mediocre innovation we've seen <clears throat> in a lot of areas. One thing you mentioned was like the water circulation pump that allows you to get hot water to your tap without um, pouring it down the drain. And I've seen this years ago and I can't figure out why nobody I know has one. It seems like the, the most worthwhile way to not waste water or waste the energy that was put into it to heat it. Yeah, and I have to confess, I don't have one. Uh, and I've been thinking about, do I, <laughs> should I get one of those? I think I probably should. Um, there are two issues. One is that some of these things that we take for granted, we take them for granted. They're mm -hmm. in the background. Yeah. I ask people, what kind of countertops do you have in your kitchen? Mm. And most people can tell me, but then I ask people, 
um, what kind of heating system do you have? Mm -hmm. Is it force hot water or is it steam? And it's like, what do you mean? <laughs> um, what kind of compress, like, what is your cooling system? Who manufactures it? Right. What kind of compressors does it have? What kind of refrigerant gas does it use? Like, I have no clue. So out of sight, out of mind on those things. It's out of sight, out of mind. And, and you, when you buy it, you buy it once you put it in the corner of your house and then you forget about it because you just expect heat or cold or water or electricity. So you, the only time you think about it is when something's not functioning the mm -hmm. way it's supposed to, when it's a hot day and your air conditioning is not working. That's like, uh, something's wrong. I should probably go, Oh wait, I don't have an air conditioner. Look at that. So how do we stop being blind to these opportunities to innovate that are right in front of us? I think, uh, probably the best way to do that is, people like you and me talking about them, <laughs> right. um, putting out projects. I, I um, am not the best at putting my work out in public. Mm -hmm. One years ago, Brie Pettis told me, if it's not on the internet, it doesn't exist. And That's a good point. Nice. Yeah. It's a really great point. So, mm -hmm. um, so I fault myself for that. But at the same <laughs> time, I totally appreciate it's hard. I spend most of my time in the lab building stuff. Mm -hmm. I work 100 plus hour weeks and then figuring out, well, when am I going to find the time to actually document properly and then publish the work? It's, it's trade off. So uh, when you're not working 100 hour weeks, um, you might be blowing off some steam reading sci-fi. Yes. Um, we were just talking about this. I read a ton of sci-fi and I'm delighted that you have similar interests. Um, we both loved Fire Upon the Deep by Verno yes. Berg. Uh, Verge, uh, I may have pronounced that wrong, but it's just so rare I found someone that read that. We, we talked about several others, and it has me thinking, um, how does sci-fi inspire you, and how has it affected your creativity and your career? Yeah, um, sci-fi is uh, something that has re-unlocked my imagination. Mm -hmm. And I say that having grown up I think is a fairly creative, imaginative kid. Like my brain was always thinking about what the possibilities were and I would suck in all of the sci-fi movies and cartoons. Um, I read a ton of fantasy. I actually didn't read so much sci-fi growing up, but I read a ton of fantasy and it was just imagining the way the world could be and it just <laughs> was super exciting. And then I got through college, got two engineering degrees and I felt after college like, oh, I'm inventing toys and I'm actually having the creativity crushed <laughs> from my soul, uh, it was it was just I was a different person. And as things were working towards MIT, and then I got hired and uh, was told, yeah, you have to create magic and impact. I just thought to myself, you know, I'd start reading sci-fi again. Actually, um, my wife and I would read a book together and then talk about it. And we were doing that, you know, four or five books a year. But with MIT. And this impossible challenge, I said, I need to do whatever I can mm -hmm. to, to turn the imagination back on in my brain. Like, the imagination has to be at 20, not 10, <laughs> not 11, 20. And the only thing that I could think of that could help me envision a bunch of different possible futures was getting into the brains of a bunch of futurists, a bunch of sci-fi writers who are just exploring different possibilities, exploring different worlds. And uh, that was really a good thing. I think that's a, a really great way to put it. I, I feel the same way about it. And it seems like, you know, there are entire generations of engineers who have seen sci-fi and then said, I can totally build that. And, yeah. and maybe they pushed the state of the art ahead because of that inspiration. Yep. Mm. Yep. Well, great. It's been so wonderful to speak with you today and, and uh, glad to see you at the Super Conference. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me here. It's a wonderful conference. Everyone should come. <laughs>